All right, hello everybody and welcome to our digital webinar series. Um, this is hosted by the um, University of Southern California Clinical and Translational Science Institute um, at USC and Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. My name is Eric Peterson. I am an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Um, we've got our uh, Twitter handles here if you're interested in following us. We also have uh, many of you are on our mailing list and you receive uh, updates about our webinars um, throughout the throughout the years. Um, I just want to just a few housekeeping things. So what you'll see here on your right, you will see um, to the right of the slides, you'll see a Q&A panel. There's also a chat panel. I'm going to post some things in the chat panel, um, some websites here in a second. But if you have any questions throughout, click on the Q&A panel and you can type in your question there. Um, our presenter today will uh, be addressing questions at the at the end of her talk, and so you can type those in whenever you want, or wait till the end. That's fine too. All right. And so we are very excited to have um, Dr. Stephanie um, Hausstein here from the University of Ottawa's School of Information Studies. Uh, Dr. Hausstein will discuss disseminating scientific papers via Twitter. So a topic that um, many of us are very interested in, many of you are already on Twitter. Um, and if you are not, um, she is probably going to convince you to try to get on there as soon as possible. Um, she's an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa School of Information Studies. Um, she teaches research methods and evaluation, um, knowledge organization, information visualization, social network analysis, and information literacy. Um, Dr. Hausstein's research focuses on scholarly pub uh, communication, bibliometrics, Altmetrics and Open Science. She's also the co-director of the SCALCOM Lab, a research group based in Ottawa and Vancouver that analyzes all aspects of scholarly communication in the digital age. And this is gonna be one of those um, websites that I uh, will post here for you here in the, in the chat, if that comes out. And then um, I'd also um, direct you to um, Dr. Hausstein's uh, website as well. Um, she has great resources and um, tells you a little bit more about her and her work or publications there. It's really well designed. It's one that I might try to come at some point, but uh, very neat uh, resource uh, if you wanna check that out. So I'm um, going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Hausstein. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us um, and it's all yours. Yes, thank you very much, Eric, for uh, the great introduction and also the perfect pronunciation of my last name, uh, which is German, where I'm from. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about Twitter and I'm just gonna share my slides here. Hoping that it will work, yep. So um, just in case I also send out a link if you wanna download the slides, they are on Zenodo. Um, so I will be talking about uh, disseminating scientific papers uh, on Twitter, and I'm going to do this a little bit from a practical insights point of view, um, because I do share my papers on Twitter and I see other people doing it. Um, but this is also my research topic. So I actually uh, analyze scholarly communication, um, do bibliometrics and, and altmetrics. Um, so I'll show you a bit about this research um, and show you some evidence of of uh, what other people are looking at when um, when they analyze scientific papers on Twitter. So as an outline for today's webinar, I want to talk to you a little bit about social media and academia, uh, what the role of social media is, uh, if and for what reasons uh, um, researchers, students, professors are using uh, social media. And I want to, uh, of course, uh, focus on Twitter because this is the one platform that we'll focus on today. Okay, it looks like a few of us got muted. Let me see if I can fix that. Okay. Yeah, I can you hear me again? Yep. Okay. Somehow my the connection was lost. I hope it works again. So yep, we're back on. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
Um, so, um, yeah, I want to talk to you about metrics with a focus on uh, metrics based on Twitter. Um, and then last but not least, I want to give you a, a quick outlook on uh, metrics literacies and, and what that means. This is a topic that I'm focusing on with my research right now. So to talk about social media, uh, how Twitter and other social media platforms are used in academia, um, there is one study that is, uh, to be honest, starting to get dated. So this was done by Nature in 2014. Uh, and they basically asked uh, some 3,500 uh, 3, researchers from, uh, from STEM, engineering, medicine, and also the humanities uh, and social science, what kind of, um, well, social media, but they also say, say here, research profiling platforms. So they, they also have right on top Google Scholar, which I wouldn't really consider a social media platform, but yes, it's a research profiling site. Um, and uh, if you consider the, the actual like social network or social media accounts here, you see that um, at least among, uh, among science and engineering, where they asked 3,000 people, ResearchGate was um, by far the uh, most popular, actually, the most used, um, but actually less so in the humanities and social sciences. And this is already one finding that we'll see again repeated for Twitter later. There are quite big differences between scientific disciplines. Um, Facebook really interestingly was was actually known or people knew Facebook, uh, almost all of them were more than 90%. Um, but for their research or in the context of their work, uh, scientists only uh, was only about 40 or less than 40% that actually used it for their work. Um, Twitter, interestingly, was among the um, really well known and popular pl platforms, but not really uh, used a lot. So in, in this survey by nature, it was less than 10% of these researchers that actually use Twitter um, regularly. And uh, this has also these kind of findings. So this is not the only study. Um, other studies, uh, other surveys found something similar so that a lot of people knew about Twitter, but they didn't really use it regularly. And this has kind of earned uh, Twitter this, um, um, well, people in, in, especially in academia, consider it a kind of a hype medium. So everybody talks about it, but nobody really uses it. And yes, the study is now already uh, six years old. So uh, it would be nice to, um, to update it again. And you also see that, for example, some of these platforms like Google Plus don't even exist anymore. So um, while at the same time, Microsoft Academic has, has really become uh, really popular. In the, in the last couple of months or years. So um, this is just to show you that Twitter, although you might know a lot of people who use it also in an academic context, it's actually not that widely spread. If we do you, uh, look at other studies, and there's a reference down here to our lit review that we did, um, it's depending on the study and the context, about 10 to 15% of academics that use Twitter in the context of their work. And um, why do they use it? It's mostly to post work content, to follow uh, discussions about their research, to also discover papers, so new publications, um, and also for, for social context. So they actually want to network and, and find new peers and, and follow what other people in their field are doing. Um, but there's also quite a bit of criticism and reluctance. So people have called Twitter a very shallow medium. So they've been talking about so-called pointless babble. Um, and also really complained about that Twitter really blurs the boundaries between um, what's more private uh, opinion and, and uh, scholarly communication, maybe. There have also been a couple of cases where um, especially um, uh, university faculty have, have said things on Twitter that uh, were definitely very problematic and some of them even got lost their jobs due to that. So um, in that context, it's also important to know that a tweet, even if it's now 280 characters and not how it used to be 140, it's still a quite uh, short message and it's it can often be taken out of context. So if you use Twitter professionally, then uh, you want to make sure that um, you put at least a little bit of thought into what you're you're saying on the platform. And I really like this um, these graphs here on the right, also from the same nature study of the slide before. Um, it really shows that um, uh, platforms 
like microblogging like Twitter or in, in China, for example, you have um, Weibo um, versus ResearchGate, which is more a kind of a Facebook or a social network for researchers. They're completely used for different purposes. So you see that the most frequent answer uh, among the people using ResearchGate recently uh, uh, regularly just says, well, I'm only really using it in case I get contacted. So that's often um, kind of uh, triggered by an email by ResearchGate. Somebody has is asking for your full text, or somebody has asked you a question. Then people log in. Other question, uh, other um, aspects or, or uh, motivations to use it was uh, to discover peers. Um, so it's more uh, focused on the the person. Um, On, on the user um, and also this other hand mostly used for um, uh, to follow discussions uh, to post work content or different content um, and then also for uh, discovering peers discovering recommended papers um, commenting on other research or sharing links to author content so um, you really see that it depends a bit on um, what type of platform you're picking and what kind of uh, reasons or motivations you have to use it so um, depending on what you want to do uh, you might pick a different platform since we're focusing on twitter for this um, for this presentation i just want to show you uh, the number of users so this is 2018 I'm, i might also uh, update this uh, soon but it just gives you an overview that yes the the majority of users come from the us um, japan uk um, but if you look at the percentage of populations um, that use Twitter, uh, you, you might get really different, um, uh, different distributions. And this is just to show you that obviously when you're um, thinking about using a platform like Twitter, you have to take into uh, consideration who else is using it. And um, if you are from the US or, US or an English speaking country, um, Twitter is uh, very helpful. Um, to connect with your community, but it might not reach um, every members of your uh, community. So, for example, in Iran and China, Twitter is not even uh, available or allowed, right? So um, you have to keep that in mind if you consider using Twitter. Um, this was uh, a, a study that we did based on a, a couple million of, of tweets that were collected by the company Altmetric. And Altmetric captures when tweets mention scientific papers, or more precisely, when they link to um, a, an ID for a publication, such as the DOI or the PubMed ID or an archive ID. Um, and we looked at those tweets that had a geolocation, not all of them do, about two thirds of the um, uh, tweets captured by Altmetric con contain some information about where the user is from. And you see that. Um, you have a really heavy bias towards um, the US, obviously, also the UK, um, Canada, Australia, Brazil, India, um, Mexico. You have to keep that in mind um, when you're, again, you're analyzing data um, or you're looking especially at metrics based on tweets that you these come with the biases of um, the people the location of the people. So one of the early motivations of alt metrics was actually that um, compared to more traditional bibliometrics like citation indicators, that they would be more democratic and less biased um, towards towards English speaking content, for example. That's not true. Like Twitter is at least, if not more, biased towards the US and the UK um, than a citation databases, for example. Um, when it comes to academics on Twitter, so uh, obviously you do you. So if you already have a Twitter account, you decide how you want to present yourself. I just uh, took a couple of screenshots here. Um, this is uh, our team from the Skullcom Lab. So uh, Juan Pablo Alperin and I, we're uh, co-directing it. And then we have um, some associate researchers and PhD students and research assistants. And you see that, um, yeah, they all look pretty different. Um, it really depends on how you want to present yourself. For example, I'm saying I'm an assistant professor at the school, I'm linking to the school and the university account. Uh, and then I add a couple of keywords um, about what I do. Uh, my co-director, Juan Pablo, he gets a bit more personal. He says he's a Latin American extraordinaire. He's a scholar, but also a father. 
Um, and he even says he's a self-declared king of uh, botch. So uh, it's up to you what you say, but remember that, um, or keep in mind that if you want to use Twitter for academic purposes, you might want to present yourself at least partly as an academic. So you want to say, uh, are you a PhD student? Are you a postdoc? Where do you work? And maybe even a couple keywords of what you're working on because the Twitter bio, this, this short message here, is um, how people will decide if they follow you or don't follow you. They might find you that way, um, which is also a good reason to actually use your, your real and full name um, uh, in, in your, in your, um, in the name that you have displayed, not necessarily in the handle, that's up to you what you use. So I wanna focus on journal articles shared on Twitter. And given the, the topic, I actually picked up um, a preprint. So something that is still uh, not reviewed, but in press at a radiology journal about uh, COVID-19. And uh, uh, you might imagine that uh, a lot of these papers, you probably heard that they're all made open access, which is fantastic, which means um, everybody can read them without paying, with uh, removing the paywall. It kind of shows too that uh, that now publishers are making this open access because we're in a global pandemic and a, and, a, and a global crisis, but it kind of also highlights that everything should actually be open access because if it's not, if it's uh, paywalled, if you have to pay to read the content, then, well, there's a really big barrier that kind of impedes uh, scholarly communication and makes it slower. So. Um, but the great thing about COVID, uh, most of the papers are available for free. And yes, they are not only um, uh, cited and, and uh, presented, but they're also being discussed on social media. So on the bottom left here, you see a screenshot of um, how Altmetric uh, actually uh, presents um, this kind of so-called impact or the Altmetrics for this paper. You see it, it was covered in three news outlets in three blogs, uh, on two Facebook pages, uh, one, I think, YouTube video, and then 126 tweeters. Um, I took a couple of screenshots just to show you how these tweets would look like. Um, they are really, really different. So uh, many different languages, not only English, although English uh, prevails, I think, but you see some um, Arabic here. Um, uh, or Persian, this might be, and uh, you see a lot of lots of Spanish as well. If you go to the site, and I just wanted to show you some examples of how, how these tweets look could look like. So um, here, the first one uh, that's a bit bigger on the right, uh, somebody's actually replying to a conversation with um, three other people on on um, on Twitter, and and looking at their handle, they might actually be medical doctors. Um, so they have MD or doctor in their Twitter handle. And then uh, this tweet says, CT findings have been recorded, recommended as major evidence of clinical diagnosis in Hubei province by the National Health and Health Commission of China. Um, RT-PCR positive for COVID-19 remains the reference standard. So this is really somebody recommending this paper, uh, talking about it. Things. But actually what's much more common uh, what we've seen in the last couple of years looking at tweets linking to scientific papers is that most people um, more or less just tweet the paper title. So you see this, uh, those three tweets down there. It, it all just says coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, a perspective from China, and then the journal radiology. So um, there's definitely a big difference between these two because um, while these three tweets that I showed down here, they're maybe just diffusing it. They're saying there is a paper with this title out there. Um, they're not really recommending it though, or, or talking about the content, or the person on top has clearly read it. So um, there are there's quite a, a large span of, of what a tweet, even though it's only 240, uh, 280 characters, um, what that meaning could be. And then I also came across something else. So this is actually interesting because uh, this is a monthly review um, and uh, at least as far as I could see, this monthly review does not use DOIs or, or IDs for a paper. So um, actually Altmetric, the company that I showed you before, does not track the tweet. So we wouldn't even capture it um, if we're using Altmetric. So, um, but I, what I found here was quite interesting too, because this, this user here who calls themselves Potato Fan, uh, uh, 
um, wrote, the first part of this article is very good. Then it's mind. How bad it gets. So this is a friend you kind of see in the background. I, I took a few screenshots of that too. This was a whole thread by this Twitter user um, who listed, who listed, uh, I think uh, about ten tweets and was really arguing and and taking screenshots of the content why the paper got so bad. Um, you you might uh, take from this uh, what you want from this uh, potato fan, whoever this is. Um, I think it says uh, from Southern Florida, if I if I see this correctly. Um, but they have definitely read the paper and they have something to, something to say about it. So that's just as a as a like of kind of um, idea of of what it could mean um, to share an article on Twitter. It could mean anything from just uh, purely diffusing and saying this paper is available versus having a whole discussion or argument. Um, why it's a good or actually a bad paper. So this is kind of something you have to keep in mind when we talk about scholarly metrics, uh, where we might value a tweet as something positive. So um, getting over to the, the part of scholarly metrics, um, this is uh, mostly quantitative indicators that I used uh, today in the, the context of research evaluation. So you might have heard about um, different types of metrics and you've probably heard the name impact because uh, or the, the word impact so uh, each and every researcher uh, no matter at what career stage they're at they're supposed to produce impactful research and um, we differentiate there between two different types of impact one would be scholarly or scientific impact so um, being impactful or influencing uh, your your peers or your the research uh, the colleagues that you have um, and that is usually measured uh, by citations. So uh, when we when we publish um, our work, we usually cite other um, publications that have influenced it. Um, so uh, based on this, from a sociological perspective, we can talk about the palette of peer recognition, as Robert Merton called it, um, in, in terms of how we're kind of acknowledging that somebody else else has uh, had a great idea that we're now building upon. So um, citations, um, if they accumulate, can be seen as a form of influence, uh, influence or impact on the scholarly community on on actually the number of uh, publishing authors, because only somebody who publishes and then cites is actually showing that you've impacted them. There are also other types of impact measures. Uh, within the scholarly community that are not citations. So you could think of the number of downloads. So uh, if you're teaching a course, for example, and you put something on your reading list, then your students uh, will download and read the paper, hopefully, um, but they might not cite it. But then we also uh, have this, this um, idea of societal impact. So ideally research because it's mostly publicly funded is also supposed to benefit society. Sometimes very directly, um, sometimes more um, indirectly and later down the down the road. Um, but the whole motivation is always that research would be beneficial to society, to the advancement of society. Um, and this is something that uh, that especially funders, governments and so on want to measure. Um, and there has been a, a big data push with uh, the era of big data and social media, where a lot of um, uh, a lot of platforms now have IPIs that, that let you access the data um, of this, this kind of social media use. So for example, Twitter has APIs where you can track the number of tweets or the, the tweet content or the user that have been talking about a certain topic, for example. On the other hand, we also have uh, in scholarly communication or research evaluation, this policy poll that um, uh, policymakers, so government funders, uh, university administrators, they want to measure societal impact. They think this is something that would be worth tracking because they want to uh, uh, they want to continue to give funding to the researchers that that are really have positive impacts on society. So the idea here was that, yes, maybe data from Twitter, from Facebook, from blogs, uh, from GitHub, from Wikipedia and all the other sources could be helpful to measure societal impact because many of these platforms are actually used um, by members of the general public and not only uh, 
scholars or academia themselves. So that was a good idea, but unfortunately it's not that easy. So if we look at the different types of metrics we have, we have this uh, these more traditional ones that we call bibliometrics. They have been around for um, uh, since at least the 1960s, if not even longer. Um, and we could look at publications. Mostly we look at peer reviewed journal articles because uh, those are covered by databases like the Web of Science, Scopus, uh, Now Dimensions, um, Microsoft Academic, uh, or Google Scholar, for example. Uh, but we could also look at books. This is especially important for fields like uh, in the social sciences and humanities who don't really publish that much in journals. Uh, conference proceedings, which are extremely important for fields like computer science. Um, or if we uh, think a little bit ahead, more and more uh, fields now or more and more journals also require uh, that data sets get published. Um, so why not consider the data set a publication and not only the, the journal article talking about it? Then we have the other side of, uh, so publications mostly stand for productivity um, and uh, uh, citations for the impact part. And again, we're mostly looking at peer reviewed uh, citations coming from peer reviewed journals because we have the data on that, but uh, potentially you could also look at citations in the books and conference proceedings or even in policy documents. Uh, and the third kind of axis of bibliometrics is collaboration. So we can look at how researchers um, collaborate, how they um, uh, work together, and this is mostly um, uh, recorded based on co-authorship. For the usage metrics, which are kind of between the more traditional metrics and what we call alt metrics or web metrics, um, uh, libraries have been capturing that basically since academic journals are digital. Um, they're looking at the number of views, downloads um, of, of, uh, of the PDFs, of the, of the full text of articles, but we could also look at reuse. So how have people reused a theory uh, or a data set, for example? So there are multiple um multiple possibilities to look at usage and then we have the whole um realm of social media metrics and most of them uh are are summarized under under this keyword of alt metrics we can have social networks uh social reference managers like Mendeley or zotero where you can count the number of people who have saved the bibliographic information in in their reference manager you could look at social data sharing, uh, blogging, microblogging, wikis, social recommending and reviewing sites like Reddit, for example. Um, so the list is very long. These are just a couple of examples, but this is just to give you an overview of, of what different scholarly metrics we could be talking about. In this graph, um, they're summarized. So this is actually based on, a, on a, um, an older paper uh, by a from bibliometrics would different metrics formation metrics was metrics the web metrics based on the web and alt metrics was kind of subset of of some of those based on the web um and the combination of what bibliometrics and scientometrics are uh, is what I call scholarly metrics. And most recently, uh, those don't really exist yet, but uh, um, more and more people are working on, on creating metrics also for research data. So focusing on webometrics and altmetrics. So webometrics have been around since the 1990s, since the web has been there. And uh, Blaise Cronin um, has already kind of foreseen what altmetrics might and webometrics might do later. So uh, he said in 1998, polymorphous mentioning is likely to become a defining feature of web-based scholarly communication. And then in 2005, he, he said there will soon be a critical mass of web-based digital objects and usage just statistics on which to model scholars' communication behaviors and with which to track their scholarly influence and impact broadly conceived and broadly felt. So although this was uh, quite some time before uh, altmetrics even popped up, uh, Cronin kind of like foreshadowed what, what, we would, um, what we would be looking at. And then before the term altmetrics was actually invented, um, PLOS came around. So PLOS, um, the open access journal, 
uh, was a really, or the open access journals, open access publishers, um, was a, a pioneer in, in what we now call alt metrics because they started with article level metrics, uh, one of the really important ones being downloads, but they also uh, quickly started capturing uh, mentions on the web, uh, tweets and so on. Um, and then alt metrics um, was, was published uh, um, in, in 2010 and um, uh, it was defined uh, as the study and use of scholarly impact measures based on activity in online tools and environments. And quickly uh, researchers found out that it's um, maybe a good idea, but a pretty bad name because altmetrics stands for alternative metrics, alternative to the more traditional citation based metrics. But uh, we found out pretty quickly that they definitely are not an alternative. Uh, if so, they are uh, maybe a complement. So if we want to measure or, or look at these Twitter based metrics, what we usually do is um, we have a large database of, of uh, scientific publications or the bibliographic information, the metadata about them. Um, uh, we usually use the Web of Science, but you could use others like Dimensions, Scopus, uh, Microsoft Academic. Then you would take uh, an identifier such as the DOI, uh, which is a persistent short ID number uh, for a scientific paper. Um, we get data from Altmetric, but again, there are also others like Plum Analytics, for example, or Crossref now who's uh, providing providing data on this. And then we would um, know which of these documents got mentioned on different platforms, different social media sites like Twitter, for example, and then we'll get more information about the tweet from the Twitter API. And what we do with it is basically creating a lot of statistics that tells us uh, tell us more about um, what kind of disciplines are shared. Um, so here uh, I took all the uh, journal articles published in 2015, covered by um, uh, peer or published in peer reviewed uh, journals covered by the Web of Science. So overall, I had uh, two million records here. Um, uh, Seventy six of those had a DOI, so I could match them to the two. Tweets. Um, so um, my hundred percent in the end was um, was uh, uh, the subset of, of these uh, the the seventy six percent and overall thirty six percent of us records were tweeted at least once. Um, it was overall three point nine uh, million tweets um, and uh, six hundred. Um, 600,000 individual users who tweeted those articles. So what you see here, though, is a really big difference between disciplines. So the highest percentage, so the Twitter coverage is basically just the percentage of papers with at least one. Um, so that got men mentioned on Twitter. You see that feels like psychology, um, health, uh, biomedical research, they have um, almost two thirds of their papers, 59% of their papers get mentioned on Twitter, which is, it's, it's really a lot. Um, but then you see fields like uh, engineering and technology and mathematics that have rates below uh, 10%. So if you want to compare Twitter impact, um, you really have to make sure that you don't compare different disciplines with each other, because there's a huge difference, not only in the coverage, but if you look at density, which is basically the average number of tweets per paper, you see that uh, in biomedical research, you get on average 5.4 tweets per um, article, while in uh, math, it's only 0 0.4. And the same goes for users. In clinical medicine, the number of, of users is very high at 6.2. Um, in, in math, it's very low with 2.2. So that's just to keep in mind that there are differences between disciplines. There are also big differences between journals. So um, a lot of studies found that uh, the number of Twitter users tweeting articles is much higher for um, well-known high impact biomedical journals. And you see some something like that here too. So this is the number uh, this is the, the journals based on the 2015 publications um, with the largest number of tweets. So you see they're, they're ranked here by um, number of tweets from plus one with the largest, um, uh, sorry, the, the second largest here. Uh, it's, it's actually ranked by the number of, um, 
of users at the end. So plus one had the largest number of users, 59,000, um, but also a lot of tweets. Then if you look at the percentage, what that means for the number of um, papers that got at least one tweet, um, journals like Nature, Science, uh, New England Journal of, um, uh, Journal of Medicine, they have uh, almost all their papers, if not exactly all their papers online, uh, or on Twitter, I should say, while um, journals like Scientific Reports, it's about uh, 50%. And you also see that in, in the category on the right, where I listed the top three most active users for this journal. Um, and in bold, I uh, I kind of highlighted if um, that user account the, among the top three was the journal itself or the publisher. You see that here, that it's mostly the, the journal itself that kind of promotes its, its Twitter um, or its its articles and, and share them on Twitter. So you have to kind of be careful if you think that uh, tweets mean impact right away. Um, I think their Twitter is a great marketing instrument for that too. Look at the number of users and uh, number of tweets here per, per source uh, of these, um, of all the tweets for the um, for the articles published in 2015, you see here that you get a couple of outliers. So um, you have some journals that have an extremely high number of users and um, um, uh, tweets, uh, sorry, tweeted documents. Um, and uh, so you see, for example, that Nature is right up there with, with lots of users um, and quite a number, a high number of tweeted publications, but then you also have an outlier like Archive, the uh, preprint server, where you actually, you still get lots of users and lots of tweeted documents, but you get relatively fewer users if you compare it to Nature, for example. And this is also what we found, uh, that there are a lot of bots, so um, automated Twitter accounts that automatically tweet every submission to Archive or every publication on Archive. So that has nothing to to do with uh, individuals talking about a paper. It's an automated procedure that takes the RSS feed of archive and tweets it. Here's just an overview of the most active users that I found in, in, um, in, in Altmetric. Uh, they are ranked by the number of tweets they sent. So this is the, the top 16, I think, uh, more than 30,000 tweets overall. You see that they tweet very regularly and the patterns here, uh, the activity per week um, is very regular and sometimes identical. And you see that, that actually, I think all of these um, accounts, the highest ones are bots. Um, when we look at all the users that have at least 1000 tweets, we try to classify them. Um, and most of the bots don't even really try to hide that they are automated. They're saying like, well, what we're doing is tweeting um, all papers about HIV, for example. Um, so they're not trying to game the system or anything. They're trying to be something like an RSS feed. Um, what you do see is that on average, they have um, very few followers, so people don't really follow those, while the journal, journal and publisher accounts um, get a, a much higher median of like 3,000 um, followers, while the bots only have a median of 200 followers. Obviously, the, the bots also tweet much more frequently, about uh, five times per day uh, as a median or 14 times on average, uh, while the journal and publisher accounts have between one and two tweets per day. It's also interesting to look at hashtags. So what kind of hashtags are shared most of, often um, in tweets that link to scientific papers? Um, they're, they're very general uh, terms like science, cancer, physics, open access, health, paper OOA, um, very similar in the in the other data set. Um, and it also shows you a little bit about like how many different users use uh, a, a hashtag on average. And um, uh, usually hashtags are made to bring communities together, um, but you still see that, that the mean number of um, users per hashtag is still one. So it's a very skewed distribution. Um, and uh, uh, basically, um, uh, the usage per hashtag is, is very low. You can also see time patterns actually. So here we have um, the papers published uh, uh, in each year from 2012 when Altmetric started capturing tweets to 
2015, and we plotted this over uh, a whole year. And you actually see weekday patterns. So like Saturday and Sunday are much lower, and the peak is kind of on a Wednesday where, where people tweet most about scientific papers. But you also see um, this kind of um, seasonal pattern that um, uh, in in fall, there's like this really big increase of, of tweets, um, and there's a slight dip in the summer where people tweet with less and then obviously the end of the year over the holidays there's much less activity in general so what can you conclude from uh using twitter metrics well um i haven't even shown you any correlations because that's kind of been uh i think in, in alt metrics we're kind of over correlations because we've been for the first uh five years or so every study was correlating tweets with citations and we basically found there's either none or only a very weak co correlation between number of citations and tweets. Um, so although initially um, studies had, had claimed or thought that tweets could be an early indicator of, of citations, um, tweets definitely don't are not a substitute for, for citation indicators. They measure something so, uh, different. Um, we also know that uh, the more recent a paper is published, the higher the tweets will be. Um, so you need to account for uh, an age difference. Um, so if something was published now in 2020, it will probably get more tweets than something that was published in 2015. Um, and if you have a paper that was published even before um, Twitter existed, it's, it's much lower than the chance, much lower that it gets tweeted at all. You also, as you saw in the uh, comparisons of the disciplines, you need to normalize for field because articles in biomed or social science um, and health get tweeted much more often than um, those in, in the STEM field. Um, that's actually quite interesting. Um, it, it's probably partly due to uh, the different disciplines behavior so that people from STEM are probably not uh, as likely to be on Twitter than people from uh, from health, uh, but also like the, the interest of the non-academic users as well. It's much easier to read a social science or a biomedical paper than it is to read a paper from high energy physics, for example. Um, you also have to keep in mind that not all tweet activity actually is impact. So there's lots of tweets that are sent automatically or for promotional purposes. So that's not really having impact or influence. Um, definitely, Tweets don't measure societal impact, or if they do, it's only a very small fraction of the Twitter activity because the majority of users sharing links to journal articles are academics themselves. Um, and so my general, I guess, tip for you would be if you use, uh, if you track out metrics, if you use, look at the number of tweets uh, or how often your tweets have, uh, articles have been mentioned on Twitter, look more at the content and who is tweeting and what they're saying rather than creating rankings um, and, and using the absolute number. And so just uh, um, to, to um, conclude about this, I think um, not only about metrics based on Twitter, uh, on tweets or other social media, uh, but even those based on publications and citations that have been around for a very long time, I think we need to develop something called metrics literacies. Um, so we kind of need to improve the way in which metrics are used and understood in academia. And uh, so I've been doing this research for, for quite a while now, um, and I always hear that scholars are already overwhelmed, um, that they have too much to read in their own field. So um, my research is kind of focusing on not uh, producing more texts about explaining uh, scholarly metrics, but actually create audiovisual open educational resources, so short videos like those you see in the background here, to educate people about different um, bibliometrics, altmetrics, or scholarly metrics in general. So the idea here is actually to develop metrics literacies, which are an integrated set of competencies, dispositions, and knowledge that empower individuals to recognize, interpret, uh, critically assess, and effectively and ethically use scholarly metrics. Um, always just in um, in addition or as a complement to peer review um, because a quantitative indicator can never replace um, um, an expert uh, recommendation or an expert review. So uh, um, my research in the, hopefully in the next coming years, we're, we're waiting for funding right now, um, or funding decisions. Uh, we wanna develop short, uh, short fun, engaging videos um, and then experimentally test what kind of format 
actually helps uh, for researchers like you to understand uh, what different scholarly metrics mean, which ones you should use, which ones uh, you should not use. Um, and we want to disseminate those resources uh, under Creative Commons by um, CC BY license so that everybody can reuse them. Um, I have a really great team that we brought together um, different uh, bibliometric experts, but also YouTubers, podcast hosts, and uh, um, a professor, a film professor, and I have a great uh, scientific uh, uh, communication community outreach team. Um, yeah, and this is basically what uh, I wanted to talk to you about. Um, you can find those slides uh, online on Zenodo, um, and I'd be very happy to uh, hear what kind of questions you have. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to, uh, this is Eric again, I'm going to take us through some of the questions. There's been a few, but please, um, please fire them off uh, onto the, the Q&A section here. Um, so the really help, really helpful stuff. I wonder if you could give us a few um, takeaways. Um, I know some of the audience members are interested in, in practically how they can apply what you've learned from your research, you know, into sharing their own research on Twitter. What are kind of the major takeaways you might give us? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, definitely say something like you, you totally uh, should share your own papers on Twitter. So obviously, um, obviously, if you already put your paper on Twitter, it's more likely to be picked up by others. So I definitely recommend sharing um, the link. Uh, definitely use the DOI or another kind of indicator in that link uh, so that um, companies like Altmetric um, basically can can uh, can track it um, so uh, definitely share it and then also make sure that uh, if you share don't only share the title but share important findings so um, so yeah don't don't just uh, put the paper title like a lot of people do but maybe we also add a, a figure uh, add some findings and maybe create a whole thread about your paper Great. I mean, a follow-up question for that too. I mean, I guess it's uh, two questions here. You know, for you know, early career researchers that are really just starting, because I know we have some people on the call that are you know just starting and hearing about Twitter and saying, you know I probably should get on this. Um, what what would you recommend? Would be you know how do you build up followers? What are some of the things you can do to help build up followers? But also, you know, one thing you know that I that I've um, wondered about is just. You know, sharing papers that are in open access, and you know, copying mm -hmm. and a, a figure that you like from the from the paper that you know might not be open access. What are your thoughts on on this? Yeah. yeah. Well, so my general uh, um, my general recommendation would be publish open access, and open <laughs> access publishing uh, doesn't uh, have to be pay paying a couple of thousand dollars for an article processing charge for an APC. There are lots of options to publish in open access journals that are free. 70% of all uh, journals in the DOAJ, in the Directory of Open Access Journals, are uh, don't require an, uh, an APC because they're usually financed by a scientific society or something like that. But even if you think it's really important for your career that you keep publishing in uh, paywall journals and sus subscription journals, um, most of them actually allow you to um, self-archive, so green open access. Um, so what I do is, because um, I'm also still an early career researcher, I uh, sometimes, I try not to, but I sometimes still publish in subscription journals if this is like the important journal in the field and it's read by the people I want to reach. Most of them, um, even the ones with uh, that are with really big publishers like uh, Elsevier, Springer, Wiley, and so on, they allow you to take your preprint or your postprint or even both and um, archive it this in a repository. So um, then on Twitter, I usually share the preprints to, I, I upload everything to archive or Zenodo, and then I share um, that preprint instead. Um, and then people can read it right away. Cool, that's really helpful. Okay, a um, couple other questions here. Um, so when we discuss impact of research, for instance, at one of our courses, we also take into consideration economic impact of research. So this goes back to when you were talking about impact. Um, what's your opinion on that, taking consideration of economic impact of research? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, um, if you are in a field where um, 
you are actually inventing technology or something like that, or um, you're you're actually applying for patents, then um, it it totally makes sense to to also value the economic impact. Um, but I would say that most researchers or most fields don't have this immediate direct economic impact, right? So um, if so, then it, it takes much longer and, until you have something that is a product that you can sell. So um, yes, economic impact should definitely be considered if it's relevant. Um, you might have um, you might have much much bigger problems in the in the humanities, for example, or in the arts to say this has economic impact. So uh, societal impact definitely includes economic impact as, as one issue, but I don't think it's relevant in in every field. Great, thank you. Um, how about this one? Do you see a role for communication departments of universities in disseminating research output via social media sites such as Twitter? Yeah, for sure. So I um, um, I think uh, we should definitely have experts uh, like science communicators, uh, people in the PR communications department help us uh, because not every researcher has the same talent or the same passion to to communicate to a larger audience. Most researchers or, or many are mostly talking, um, they use a lot of jargon, so they're mostly talking to their colleagues. Um, so yeah, if, if you do have access to a department that will do this kind of outreach for you, I definitely suggest that you work together with them. I would still say that the researchers themselves should be involved because you actually want to um, make sure that um, your findings are not boiled down to something or so generalized that they're not that true anymore, I would say, or not as relevant. So um, get in touch with them. But yeah, getting a, a, a press release out about a great finding is always good. That gives the wider reach to also the um, journalists who might pick it up. Um, and Altmetric, uh, the company or other Altmetrics uh, um, uh, platforms, they also track if something or an article got mentioned in a news um, article. And that might actually be something that that could measure societal impact a bit better because um, the journalist will already try to translate the scientific jargon into something that is that can be understood by um, some, some member that is uh, or a member of the general public that um, doesn't have the background in the field. So um, I think, yeah, trying to get get your research into into the news or into sources where a larger audience can understand and access them. That's always great. Yeah, I think, um, and also too, you know, at the point when you are applying for funding, I mean, sometimes a lot of universities and institutions have, you know, this built into the infrastructure and, you know, indirect costs might, might cover this, but, um, you know, at the dissemination stage, but also building into uh, the budget of a proposal, you know, that, that you're going to um, utilize other services to, to help promote some of the research findings. Okay, uh, here's another one. Uh, would it be possible to distinguish? Um, yeah, different yeah, for sure. And uh, more and more. So I'm sorry, go ahead. I think we got cut oh, off. Sorry. No, I think I'm lagging, but just go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, so the other question is, would it be possible to distinguish different Twitter communities when performing analyses on tweets regarding research output? Absolutely, and that's a that's an excellent question. So that was also one of the questions that we asked ourselves, like who are the people that are actually tweeting there? And I, I did mention that we found that most um, uh, users on Twitter that are mentioning in scientific papers are academics themselves. So there are a couple of studies that that had people or coders or um, basically graduate students look at a lot of Twitter accounts and try to classify them based on what people say in their bio, right? So usually people say, I am a PhD student or I'm an assistant professor, um, or they say, um, I love yoga or whatever they do, right? So there's usually some information. Um, so we were able to, to group people into if they're members of academia, so student, professor, researcher, and so on, uh, versus not. Um, and we found that uh, around two thirds of the people are members of academia. So that's why the initial idea that Twitter or tweets could measure societal impact is not entirely true. 
Um, but I like the the um, identification of, of um, communities. So that's exactly what we try to do because um, Twitter is a network, right? It's a social network. So we did social network analysis to look at how are people connected? How do they follow each other? And, and try to visualize in a network how they are connected. Um, we did a, um, uh, a small study there, just uh, 11 biomedical articles uh, to see how they got spread on Twitter. And it was really interesting. We usually had really tight interwoven, really dense networks. So that kind of told us these are people that already know each other, uh, that follow each other. So that's probably the scientific community uh, that shares the article. But um, with one article, we found a very much more diverse and much more structured a network of Twitter followers that shared the same paper. And there we saw that um, this was, I think this was a paper on um, on the consumption of sugar and cancer. Um, so so uh, this was shared by a lot of these or some kind of science communicators on Twitter, that a lot of followers um, that uh, were not members of academia. So that does happen, but the rule is more on average, it's more the academic community rather than um, rather than members of the, the public. Great, thanks. Um, here's a question that uh, I actually had myself. So, um, you know, if um, a, a lot of times departments or news media will pick up and pick up articles and they'll publish you know, a news style article discussing the findings of a paper. Um, yeah. Things are usually, you know, more accessible to people. So these are the things that um, that get tweeted out. Um, yep. It doesn't sound like these get captured by alt metrics. And is there any way around this? They do actually get uh, captured yeah. by alt metric if the the journalist, if the news article links to the paper. So that's the 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 kind of flaw. Like there are still um, uh, news articles that say the recent. Uh, a recent paper by the uh, the Stanford researcher or whatever, right? Where, where it doesn't really cite the paper, but it just says a recent paper by John Smith. Um, then it doesn't track it. But as long as there is a link uh, or the mention of a DOI, PubMed ID or, or other um, identifier, then it will be tracked by companies like Altmetric. So That's then great. you can see it. Um, but yeah, if the journalist doesn't really say this was on this paper, then it's really hard to track it. Okay, um, another one popped up here, thank you. Is it the paper or the tweet content that predicts the reach on Twitter? Um, oh, that's that's an interesting, that's a really great uh, question. And I don't know really, because it's it's definitely a mix and it's really hard to isolate or, or come up with an experiment where, um, you have the same well you, i guess you could do you have the same content uh and then once tweet it without you know in a really engaging way on twitter and then once you just sent the paper title i would definitely bet on that the the tweet that um has more content gets tweeted more but for sure um twitter cannot make a really bad paper better uh well um if the paper is really great then it also doesn't make you know, make a difference if you're on Twitter or not. So there are lots of factors that influence it. Um, one being also, um, does journal promote it? Does the, is the author themselves, are they on Twitter and they talk about it? Um, so there are a lot of different factors uh, why it might or might not be tweeted. And to really boil it down to, is it the, the content of the paper or the content of the tweet? Um, I think that might be might be a good study idea, actually, to come come up with a, with a kind of experimental setting. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, if you don't mind, maybe just one more question. Um, I know you were talking about um, how tweets don't necessarily convert to citations, um, but has yeah. anyone looked at, I mean, one thing that, that I've found on, that Twitter has been really helpful for, and I don't have a ton of followers, um, but it is nice. I've actually found it, I've connected with a lot of new new um, collaborators, new colleagues. Yes. Uh, has anyone looked at the presence of uh, Twitter on you know increasing new collaborations? Yeah. Uh, not directly, I think, um, but also a really great idea. Uh, I, so I also, I'm looking at Twitter from two perspectives. One of being a Twitter user, um, and I use Twitter mostly professionally, although I have to say with working from home, boundaries start to blur a little bit. <laughs> 
but um, I, I really like using Twitter to connect with new people. I've definitely uh, made connections. Um, I always enjoy when I've like interacted with somebody on Twitter for years and finally I meet them at a conference or somewhere at a talk. It's always great because you al already think you know that person, although you've never met. Um, so that definitely helps and I would definitely recommend it. And I think there's also less of a the, the hierarchy that we usually have uh, where more established scholars are maybe harder to interact with. I, I feel that's that's less so the case on Twitter and you can just become part of a conversation or ask people directly. Um, from the other perspective of being somebody that looks at scholarly metrics and Twitter as a data source, I'm very skeptical. So um, I don't think it translates one, one to one. It can predict um, the future citation impact because there are, first of all, there are so many highly cited and really great papers that never make it onto Twitter for whatever reason. Um, but there are also a lot of papers that aren't really great because, uh, but they get a lot of tweets, um, but they don't get the tweets because of the scientific excellence. But there are a lot of like jokes too. So there's this really famous example called the, the crappy Gabor paper. Uh, so that was a paper that was published in, um, in a medical journal and uh, it went through peer review, multiple rounds of revision and was published and uh, the authors had forgotten to take out um, a little comment that said, should we cite the crappy Gabor paper here? So Gabor being the, the last name of an author. Uh, so obviously people thought that was hilarious that it, this was published and the authors had forgotten to take out that comment out of their manuscript and nobody in peer review had seen it. So that was one of the most tweeted papers uh, for a while. And obviously not because the content was so great, but because people were making fun of it. Sure, yeah, no, that's pretty, that's interesting. Um, okay, so I wanna wrap up now. I wanna um, thank Dr. Hausstein very much for um, for this great talk um, and all the, also these great resources. I'm gonna post it uh, in the chat right here. In the public chat, um, we will have this uh, recording up. It usually just takes us a few days to get it up there, so please take a look. Um, you can share with your colleagues. Um, I'll share the link on Twitter if you'd like. Um, and I just want to mention that we are going to do uh, another webinar at the end of this month. Uh, I'm going to try to lead one on um, digital recruitment, so recruitment from social media for research studies, uh, mostly you know survey studies, but also talk about some of the digital randomized controlled trials that, that I've been doing. Um, and, doc and thank you, Dr. Hausstein, for the uh, slides she's posted in the, in the chat as well. So once again, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for attending. And I uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the week. Thanks for having me. Have a good day, everyone.